Our next guest is the 12th U.S. Secretary of Education. Please welcome Secretary Miguel Cardona to the South by Southwest studio. Hello. Hi. Great welcome. to see you. Great to see you again. Great I'm to see so you glad you came back, yeah, um, both to the studio and the yeah. EDU. So let's start with diversifying teacher workforce, sure. encouraging more teachers of color. How do we best get there? Well, first of all, we have to make sure that our students of color are finding success in our K-12 schools, right? We can't talk about tapping them on the shoulder and saying, hey, become a teacher if their experience in school is not good, right? So that's a key thing. We have to make sure we're um, providing programs where all students succeed. But then middle school, high school, we say, we think you'd be a great teacher. And we provide a pathway for that, right? We can't just say that and, and turn around and not adjust classes to give them opportunities to explore what the teaching profession is. It is the best profession, by the way, and our students deserve an opportunity to, to see what a pathway into education would look like. Um, so that's, that's one of the things we need to do. And, you know, we, we're excited because for the first time ever, the department um, put $18 million in the Augusta Hawkins grant to provide pathway programs like this. This is something new. We're excited. We've been talking about it, but now we have some grantees that uh, across the country that are doing it. There are three in Texas um, to make those pipeline programs available for students, make sure colleges are also working hard on this. Like this is their problem too, right? Preparing educators, uh, making sure that they're as beautifully diverse as the students they serve, and then making sure that they're prepared uh, to teach in those classrooms because you know, we talk a lot about a teacher shortage, right? Uh, yeah. We have, this is the time now. This is the time to do this. You know, we, um, through our grants, we have different teacher quality grants. We have uh, professional development grants totaling over 400 million. But I, I want there to be a national renewed effort to, to just put our heads together to make this happen. And I think a lot of it has to do with pipeline programs, not only for our students, but for our paraeducators. A lot of our amazing paraeducators, they work in our schools. They're committed to the school, to the school community. They're making 12, 13, $14 an hour. Let's give them an opportunity to go back and get that degree, become a teacher. Um, they've already proven that they love those kids and they want to be there. I mean, I've heard so many people at this conference talk about that one teacher that inspired them, that one teacher that made them a teacher. And we know that representation matters. Of course. You want to see someone like you succeeding so that you'll go on to succeed. Absolutely. You know, I love, I, I'm, I've been blessed, you know, but I'm tired of being the counterexample tired of it right so you know about half of our students across the country identify as a student of color yet um, one in five educators less than one in five educators uh, consider themselves a, an educator of color we have to close that gap we have to close that gap and give opportunities to all students so in addition to building support for children what are some of the ways we can bolster the health and wellness of mm. teachers are there any school districts building programs that you think are making a really positive impact there are, you know, I've, I've, I visited uh, 40 states and, I, you know, I, I'm fortunate that I get, I, I'm able to look, I'm, I'm, I'm able to sit on a perch and see what's happening across the country. We have a, a best practices clearinghouse on our department. If anyone's interested, check it out. Best practices around mental health support, so on and so forth. But, you know, some of the things that really stood out to me, um, there was a, uh, a school I think it was New Mexico or Arizona, that's connected to a university and connected to a hospital. So mental health supports were available at a whole, at a different level, not only for students, but for educators. And they created pathway programs so that students can get jobs into those hospitals. I mean, that program was like top tier because it had a university and a hospital connected to a high school. Um, Canton, Michigan, they have, uh, three high schools with uh, a total student body of about 6,000. They changed the schedule for students to ensure that every student, every day, had a period devoted to mental health and uh, emotional well-being. Like, those are some bold actions, you know what I'm Very. saying? You know, and um, in Colorado, I saw a program where uh, they were connecting, again, with a hospital and a local um, behavioral health uh, uh, community partner to provide supports for the schools um, and for the educators and for the families. Look, I, I would love to see us not go back to what we had in 2019 because we had like an emergency room model, right? Yeah. When the kids are um, doing really poorly or when they have an event or when they have a traumatic experience, that's when we uh, come in with support. 
we have to provide better tier one supports to make it happen. And, you know, we, the, the Biden-Harris team get that from day one, not only with ARP, um, but also the Bipartisan Safer Communities uh, Act, which provides $2 billion to fund, support, uh, and build on mental health supports for students, for educators. It has to be, we have to care for the whole child and we have to care for the whole educator as well. It would nice, be really nice to have someone they trust before the trauma happens, exactly. before the distress happens. So it, they go to them. Absolutely. And then maybe you could prevent some of that, right? Yeah. And, um, you know, I think part of that too comes with making sure that our workforce um, has the tools that they need. You know, we, I worry a little bit, like, we, we often deals with the sim, deal with the symptoms of trauma, behavioral outbursts or disengaged students. Well, those are symptoms of trauma, right? And unless we help build capacity of our school leaders, our district leaders, our educators, um, it's going to be hard for them to have the tools they need to support that. Uh, we, we can't talk about trauma-informed practices or trauma-informed schools if we do a quick 15-minute drive-by PD. That's not how it works. So let's invest in building capacity, building systems uh, that will sustain support for our kids. I can tell you care. I mean, you speak a lot about preparing students for the jobs of the future. Yes. Tell us a bit more about your vision and efforts. We, we have, you know, I was excited about this last year. I'm more excited now. Um, I, I call it a tsunami of jobs. Um, our students now are going to have opportunities that many generations before them didn't have. Um, high skill, high paying careers, um, where you don't have to be saddled in college debt for the rest of your life. Um, you know, the infrastructure uh, plan, the Chips and Science Act, all the jobs that are coming there, um, the climate provisions under uh, the Inflation Reduction Act. We know jobs are coming. So Gina Raimondo, uh, Secretary of Commerce, Marty Walsh, Julie Sue now uh, in uh, Department of Labor. We're excited and we're working together to make sure that our two-year schools are talking to our workforce partners, those who are going to have these jobs, um, uh, and making sure that our two-year schools are connected to our high schools so that our students can start on pathways. Look, I, I studied automotive technology for four years in high school, um, and I had options when I graduated because I had a teacher that tapped me on the shoulder. But I want our students to have options. It doesn't mean they're not going to go to college. It might mean that they uh, explore a two-year program uh, at a community college that gives them credentials to get into the workforce, and then they find out what their passion is, go back and get a degree in that while making good money, uh, or maybe even the employer will pay for it, right? So there's a lot of opportunities for this. Uh, this is the most purple issue that we have right now. Uh, this is not about Republican or Democrat. This is about kids. This is about opportunities. And as I said, there's a tsunami of jobs coming, and I want to make sure our schools, our universities are prepared to be aligned to what the needs are so that uh, we don't talk about uh, having jobs that are unfilled, high-skilled, high-paying jobs that are unfilled. And let's face it, that mechanics class, it was about the function of the engine. That is a whole set of critical thinking right. that can be applied other places. Absolutely. Critical thinking can be applied to English, to science, to anything. So Absolutely. It's so important. You know, I'm an example that, yeah, you could go to a technical high school and get technical training for four years and go to college and be successful. So for me, it's about providing our students and our families with options. So we've had several guests uh, in sessions this week talk about the NAEP scores. How would you characterize them? And students seem to be behind. How do we get them back up to speed? Yeah, the NAEP uh, assessments, often called the nation's report card, right? How are we doing? Uh, the numbers this year, uh, or 22, were appalling. I, the word I used was appalling. Our students are underperforming. This is the United States of America. Our students are woefully underperforming. You know what's also concerning? That in 2019, they were pretty bad too. Yeah. Before the pandemic. Right. So the pandemic brought it to our attention again because it got even worse. But I think we've been on a, uh, a decline. And I think what's most concerning is not only the decline, but the lack of urgency around it. So we really, we feel, look, you can talk about career pathways, you could talk about mental health supports. If we're not giving our students an opportunity to succeed academically, if they're not reading on grade level, if they can't perform high level math, then we're missing the point. I, I believe me, as a, as a dad, as, a, as an educator, I understand the components of holistic support for students, 
But at the end of the day, they have to learn how to read, and they have to know how to do complex math. They have to be engaged in STEM. So we're raising the bar with mm -hmm. academics, not only recovery, but just reimagining and making sure that our standards are high, that our students are achieving, that we have highly qualified teachers in every classroom. That's another thing people want to skip out on in some states. Like, hey, let's just let anyone get in the class. No. no <laughs> that doesn't work. That doesn't work. So we're excited about raising the bar in the academics. Um, it's not just a response to the NAEP scores. It's a response to the fact that we've normalized failure in this country. And we're putting a stop to that. We're raising the bar. I mean, I, I've heard you say that let's use this as a flashlight mm. to, um, yeah. and rather than a hammer yeah. to force outcomes. Right. Well, look, you know, you, a lot of times in education over the last 20 years, data has been misused. It's been used to penalize teachers, to cause schools failing schools, to, to make communities feel less than. Um, that's the worst thing you could do. Because what you end up doing is driving out highly qualified teachers out of those communities. And then the students suffer. So what I say is data should be a spotlight uh, to the resources that are needed uh, in what areas, right? So if our students are underperforming in, in math, that data should make sure that we're driving our resources toward math instruction. Um, when we use data uh, not as a hammer to, to you know, point fingers at people, but, uh, but instead as a tool to identify where our resources are needed most, our students succeed. That's what happens. So I'm a big believer in making sure we're using multiple forms of data, not just one either, because mm -hmm. what I've seen happen sometimes, if, we, if we're fixated on one piece of data, nothing else matters, and then we cut out the arts, and then we cut out science and history and anything that's not being tested. I, I've gone through that generation of education where everyone is teaching to the test. I, I, I don't want that. Let's look at how children grow. Let's make sure that we're doing formative assessments where we can see what they're learning and it can influence instruction, but um, let's make sure we're using our data to put the resources where they belong. That's why it's so great that you're a father because you've, yeah. you've seen the whole change in yeah. education all the way to this point. Yeah. So the Supreme Court seems likely to uh, strike down the debt forgiveness plan. Even President Biden was saying that he's not confident. So if that happens, yeah. is there a plan B? Yeah. Well, look, you know, the president from day one uh, recognized the impact of the pandemic. And it's really important for me to distinguish a couple things. This debt, targeted debt relief, 90% of the benefits here will go to people making less than $75,000. This is not like, you know, you don't have to pay your college debt anyone and, and everyone gets it for free. That's not what this is. This is people that were impacted by the pandemic who will struggle to get back on their feet. Mm -hmm. We're trying to prevent defaults, bankruptcy, all that stuff. Um, so it's really important that I reiterate this targeted debt relief was done due to the impact of the pandemic. I always make it analogous to small businesses needing a little help to keep their doors open, right? We, do, we did that. There were no lawsuits there. In previous administrations, there were uh, money that went to large corporations to keep them afloat. We're trying to keep regular, everyday Americans afloat, okay? So that's the argument there. But from day one, if you look at what we've done, we've provided over $50 billion in debt relief. Um, through public service loan forgiveness, through um, you know, borrower defense, you know, students that were taken advantage of by their schools, they were lied to, and now they have debt and they don't have a, a degree that's worth anything. So we've done a lot of debt relief there. We're improving income-driven repayment, which is huge. I, I, it doesn't get a lot of attention because people are like, what is that? To me, that, that is more significant than a one-time debt relief um, fixture because it's gonna, it's gonna uh, impact multiple generations. So to answer your question, I'm focused right now in the Supreme Court. We're, but we're, it doesn't mean that this is all we're doing. We're going to continue to fight anything that we can do to put borrowers first, to make higher education accessible. I'm a first gen, and I knew what it felt like to go to school, not really have anyone around me that I could ask questions, and worry, like, can I afford this? You know, um, I get that, and there are too many Americans right now that are intelligent, capable of succeeding in college, but are afraid of it because of the costs. So this administration is gonna to continue to fight for those folks. Well, I mean, polls are definitely split yeah. on debt forgiveness, but there's a clear majority favor for reducing tuition as a way to decrease student debt. Um, what's the administration doing on that yeah. front? And, and that's a good question too, because 
you know, a lot of folks who are against debt relief are feeling like, well, we're going to be in the same position five years from now. No, we're not. No, we're not. It, to me, the work that we're doing to change the practices, um, I'm just as proud of that. So we have this thing called College Scorecard. So you could look up a college and find out it's like a scorecard. Uh, you know, what is the return on investment for that school? Are the graduates getting jobs or are they just, you know, buried in debt? So these are tools that parents could use. And we're getting more information on that. We're also very vocal about saying, instead of ranking our universities based on how big their endowments are, let's rank them based on what they're doing to make sure their kids cross the stage and that they're opening doors to students that maybe wouldn't have had an opportunity to study somewhere else. So inclusivity and college completion are things that we're valuing. And we're, we're not afraid of naming and shaming institutions that are, we feel are not a good value for students and lifting up those institutions that are really bending over backwards to meet students where they are and help them finish. Speaking of naming, you've been a critic of the annual higher education rankings published by the U.S. News and World mm -hmm. Report saying that they've created an unhealthy obsession with selectivity and that it's time to stop worshiping at the false altar of U.S. Yeah. News and World Report. I mean, is that your better alternative for gauging quality, giving them a report card? So we're developing the college scorecard and trying to make it um, inclusive of the data that parents really need to find out if those schools are worth mm -hmm. um, you know, the investment that you're going to put into it. A lot of families save up their whole lives to help ch their children go to college. We want to make sure that they have good information on it. If I'm going to take out a second mortgage right. on my house to put a kid through exactly. college, I want to know that they're going to have a good job someday. Exactly. And you know, with regard to the, the U.S. News, look, we want to, uh, we're always willing to partner with them, anyone else, as long as we're open and honest about the data that we're looking for and also valuing inclusivity. Right now, you move up the ranks if you get people out of your school. You don't let people in. Is that what we want for America? You know, so we want to make sure that institutions are meeting students where they are, providing the holistic needs that they have. The schools that did the best job during the pandemic were the ones that helped feed the students when they were hungry, provided mental health supports because the students lost a loved one, provided child, child care opportunities because um, we have a lot of parents that are trying to go back to school to improve the lives of their children. So when you have institutions that are looking at students that way, those are the institutions that we want to lift up. So Congress is currently weighing legislation to support a national minimum wage for teachers. Mm -hmm. Do you support such efforts and do you worry that some states are going to use it as a ceiling and not a floor? Right. Well, that's a worry, right? Look, we, when we talk about the teacher shortage issue, it's a teacher respect issue. It, it's a symptom of disrespect, in my opinion, f for generations. Um, I, I do support Congress acting and saying we need to do better. Um, you know, in, in, across the country, on average, teachers make 20% less than people with similar degrees. It, we've normalized teachers taking money out of their pocket to pay for things in the classroom. We've normalized teachers working on the weekends, driving Uber, bartending to make extra. These are people with master's degree that are shaping the next generation. It's been this way for a long time. It's, My fifth grade teacher was a window washer on the weekends. That's unacceptable. So we've normalized this as a country. So yes, I'm happy Congress is talking about it. We're also talking about it and making sure that we're putting pressure on states to, to do what, hey, look, you can't talk about career pathways. We can't talk about mental health if we don't have a qualified uh, you know, professionals in front of the classroom in our schools. So for me, uh, raising the bar with uh, uh, lifting the profession, it's ABCs, I call it ABCs. Provide agency for educators, trust them. They're professionals, they have degrees in this, they know what they're doing, agency. Better working conditions, meaning we have uh, social workers in the school so the teachers have the support that they need, they have professional learning opportunities, they have pathways for career growth. Okay, better working conditions, and C, ABC. Uh, competitive salaries. Comp we can't normalize the fact that teachers are going to go into this profession. They're going to be saddled in debt because, you know, when they get their master's degree, when they get their advanced degrees, they're they're deep in debt. That's a lot of school. It is, and we need to support our teachers. We called them essential workers a couple years ago. Let's show them that they're essential. Let's provide public service loan forgiveness, and let's leave their, uh, lift their salary. Yes. Yeah. 
Well, <laughs> you are in the position where you get to survey the entire landscape from your office. What are the challenges in education that you see right now, and how does the administration hope to address them? And also, what's inspiring you yeah. right now? Well, you know, the first part of the question, it's hard not to start with the inspiration. I'm inspired by our students. I was yesterday, I was talking to the United States Senate Youth Program students. So there are about 105 students from across the country. Um, so much promise in that room. I, I really feel confident in the future of our country because of our youth. Um, there's so much, so much potential. I'm, I'm inspired by the fact that unlike any other secretary, I'm able to lead at a time when we've been disrupted and we could build it back differently. I'm inspired by that. You know, like, this is our moment, right? This is the best time to be in leadership. My greatest fear is complacency, that we go back to how it was, where our NAEP scores were normalized, where gaps in achievement based on race and place were normalized, where our students left high school not knowing what they wanted to do, jumping into the first program that they see, getting in debt, and saying, oh, I don't know if I want to do that. Where we're disconnected from what's happening outside of education with our workforce needs, with our needs in our communities. To me, complacency and going back to the same system is my biggest concern, my biggest fear. Well, I got to say, sir, you inspire me. Thank so you. thank you so thank much you. for stopping by the studio. Thank you for this conversation. Yeah, this is great. I hope we can continue it. I hope I get to do it again next year. Uh, definitely. And then we can talk about the science fair next year. We'll do it. All right. I'm your host, Carrie Byron. Thank you so much for watching.